Hey y'all, it's Jennifer. Welcome back to my channel. Uh, today I am coming to you with a bit of a book haul. Uh, so I haven't gotten all of these books recently. Some of these have been sitting around for a long time and I've been waiting to kind of culminate them in a book haul. I think actually everything I'm going to show you today is a classic. Uh, so this is basically a classics book haul. I've taken several loads of books to my local used bookstore uh, many times over the past few months. So uh, I have definitely racked up some used books, uh, but I also got a few classics last month when I went on vacation. So those are included here. Uh, so several things are included that you've probably already seen me talk about, uh, but let's just get right into it because there are a lot of books here. I think the most unique classic that I've picked up recently is Notices of the Historic Persons Buried in the Chapel of St. Peter at Vincula, uh, which is the chapel in the Tower of London. And so this was an account written in the Victorian period by people who actually were doing an archaeological dig or were trying to expand the chapel, I guess, and came across several uh, bodies. Uh, one of these bodies was, of course, Anne Boleyn. Uh, and so this is kind of their account of how they found the bodies, uh, making decisions about who they might have been. Uh, so there is a lot of really interesting information here. I think they believe they found Thomas Cromwell. Uh, I think they believe they found uh, Sir Thomas More uh, and several other people who were executed on tower grounds. And so I am saving this for Victober because I think it's gonna be kind of an interesting read. Uh, and I think it would be fun to read some nonfiction in Victober, something that was probably breaking news in the Victorian period. Uh, so this is one that I'm definitely saving for later in the year. I also was able to pick up some poetry collections when I was last in my used bookstore, uh, so of course I did get a romantic. I picked up the selected poems of William Blake. I am really excited to try William Blake. He's one of the romantics that I have yet to read anything from, uh, and I actually knew very little about him until earlier in the year when I kind of discovered him. I learned a little bit about who he was personally. And I think that might be my thing with William Blake is I believe he was a really fascinating person. And I wonder if I will think he himself is more interesting than his work is. But I am really excited about this. I'm really excited to discover a new love in the Romantic era. Uh, William Blake is of kind of the earlier generation of the Romantics, which I don't like as well. I still enjoy them, but I don't like them as well uh, as some of the later generation, Byron, Keats, Shelley. Uh, so I will be interested to see how I feel about Blake. I would like to try him very soon. Speaking of English romantic poetry, I got this small old Penguin classic of English romantic poetry. And I really picked this up because though it does have a lot of heavy hitters that I've already read, uh, it also samples from some lesser known poets because often some romantic poetry will make allusion to other poets that we don't have a lot surviving from or who just plain aren't as popular anymore as they were at the time. Uh, and so this collection actually decides to start with Alexander Pope, which I love. I think that's really fascinating. I've always loved Alexander Pope. Uh, and so it's kind of tracing the origins of romanticism. Uh, but it also has uh, William Collins, who I'm not very familiar with, William Cowper, who I am, and I'm shocked that I haven't read before, uh, James McPherson, who uh, pretended to be a Scottish poet or to translate a Scottish poet named Ossian. And then we have Thomas Chatterton, who I'm really excited about because Keats references him a lot. Uh, and then, of course, we get into the big heavy hitters. We get into William Blake. We get into Robert Burns, who I've never read. Um, uh, William Wordsworth, Sir Walter Scott, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Robert Southey, um, Thomas More. That's interesting. Uh, Thomas Love Peacock, who I know a little bit about, and so I'm a little bit fascinated by. Lord Byron, Percy Shelley, John Clare, who I'm really fascinated by and I knew nothing about before picking up this edition. And then we of course have Keats, but it actually goes up into Emily Bronte's poetry, which I think is really fascinating. Uh, so the introduction was kind of talking about how 
Uh, her poetry is definitely romantic, but it's starting to skew Gothic, uh, which is a different thing. Kind of the Victorian Gothic is very different from the romantic Gothic or the Gothic of the late 1700s and early 1800s. So I'm just excited to have this small little portable edition of poetry to carry around with me uh, and to explore some English romantic poetry that I have not yet read. Find some new poets. This is really exciting. The romantic era is the gift that keeps on giving. I also picked up The House on the Strand by Daphne du Maurier, and I picked this up not only because I typically love Daphne du Maurier, but because this is apparently a bit of a time travel story. Uh, I believe a guy somehow or other goes back in time to the Middle Ages, and he can kind of go back and forth between his time and the past. And he starts getting more attached to the life that he has in the Middle Ages. Uh, and so I'm really excited about this one. This is not a Daphne du Maurier that you hear very much about. Uh, so I'm not quite sure if it's kind of a sleeper hit of hers or if people generally don't like it. Uh, so I'll be interested to see how I feel. I also recently picked up Devils by Dostoevsky. I think this is more commonly translated to demons. I've seen the title demons around more frequently than I have devils, uh, but I'm currently reading The Idiot by Dostoevsky. Also in this edition, it should be up here. I should be hauling it, uh, but I really, really fell in love with that um, almost to the end, and I definitely think I'm going to give it five stars, and so I automatically kind of went and ordered everything else that he ever wrote in the Wordsworth Classics editions. Now, these are are the Constance Garnett translations, and people do tend to have a real issue with her translations. I actually have not with Dostoevsky. Uh, in fact, I really have liked what I've seen from her, and I just really love these editions because they are so cheap and also because they do my favorite thing. You see it, don't you? They are floppy paperbacks. That's more important to me than translation. I'm sorry, but it is. The functionality of the book physically is a little bit more important to me than translation. I will pick a book that is more comfortable to read over a stiffer book that maybe has the best translation uh, because I am very petty like that. After The Idiot, I am the most excited about Devils. Uh, I really think I'm going to like this one. I think I am really, really going to rate this one quite highly. Uh, I don't necessarily have the best feeling about Crime and Punishment, but I do about the Brothers Karamazov. I'm just going to save that one for the last, I think. Uh, but this is the only one other than The Idiot, which I'm currently reading, that has come so far. Uh, so there will be more Dostoevsky in my future. Keeping on a Russian theme, uh, I got The History of the Russian Revolution by Leon Trotsky. And yeah, it's really big. In fact, it's much bigger than what I thought. When I read the dimensions of it online, I thought, well, they have that wrong. Totally, they have that wrong. No, they don't. The book is actually that big. And this is actually under 1,000 pages. I know it looks like it would be 3,000 pages, but it is under 1,000 pages. But the text is super tiny. Uh, I don't know how long it will take me to read this, but I think I'm probably going to start it pretty soon. I do typically have a nonfiction on the go, uh, and so I never really log that on Goodreads or anything. I just am always reading a nonfiction here and there, and I think I will pick this one to be my next so that I might can finish it by the time Nonfiction November rolls around. Uh, but I am really pumped about this. Uh, it's really interesting to read a history of a revolution from one of the key players in it. This is a really unique instance in history. Uh, and so I think there's going to be multiple levels to my reading of this. Not only is it just kind of a straightforward history of the Russian Revolution, uh, but it's also going to be almost a bit autobiographical of Trotsky. And then also maybe a bit of propaganda. I just think it's going to be a really interesting read on many different levels. I've also picked up a few other modern classics lately uh, because I do feel like that's a bit of a blind spot for me uh, that I would like to fill in. I would really like to get started on modern classics. I tend to feel like I really won't like them, uh, but hopefully there is one out there for me. So I decided to pick up a title by my favorite author, my favorite modern classic author, uh, and that's F. Scott Fitzgerald. So I picked up Tender is the Night. I feel like I've read this because the more that I read about this, the more familiar the plot seems to me, but I have no record of it anywhere. I did read it prior to having Goodreads, and if I read it prior to Goodreads, there is a really good chance that I've just forgotten all about it. But this is set in the south of France, and I think it deals with 
the relationship between a very fraught couple. They're having relationship problems, I believe. I'm not quite sure. I just think that I'm probably really going to like it because I do tend to like F. Scott Fitzgerald's writing. I also recently picked up uh, Count Belisarius by Robert Graves. I have read I, Claudius. It was many, many years ago, and I did really enjoy it at the time. I'm also due for a reread there. But this is set during one of my favorite time periods, which is during the very early Byzantine Empire. Uh, so this is set in the 500s during the reign of Emperor Justinian and Empress Theodore who were some of my favorite historical figures. But Belisarius was a really famous general at the time uh, and was responsible for their conquest back into Italy, uh, into Africa. One of Justinian's many goals was to reconquer everything that was lost when the Western Roman Empire fell. Uh, and so Belisarius was largely responsible for all of the successes that happened during those military campaigns. And I've heard really good things about this. It does just seem to fall a bit in comparison to I Claudius. Uh, so I'm really excited to see what he does with this because I did really enjoy his portrayal of the Emperor Claudius. Another modern classic that I've recently picked up is The Gods Will Have Blood by Anatoly France. Uh, and so this is a more modern French classic. It was written in the early 1900s and it is set during the reign of terror in the French Revolution. Uh, but it is following fictional characters to my understanding, and I had never heard of this. I came across this online a few months back, and I've been really intrigued by it ever since. And so when I saw this was on Thrift Books, this is apparently formerly a library copy, uh, I decided to pick up a copy of it. I am gonna have to perform surgery on it because as you see, the cover is pulling away from the binding, so I am going to uh, have to perform a little surgery on it to make sure that it's ready to go. Sometimes you get really lucky with thrift books and you get things that have barely been read, uh, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get a really battered library copy. I'm typically not against library copies. Uh, some people are, but they don't really bother me. In fact, I actually like the kind of reinforcement that they do to their paperbacks. This one has just clearly been read quite a bit, so hopefully that means it's good. I'm really looking forward to trying this. The last of the modern classics I picked up uh, is The Memoirs of Hadrian, uh, which is from the 1950s, I believe, and it is a translated classic. It was originally written in French, and I am just really, really looking forward to this. This has been recommended to me several times in the past few months by you guys, and I think I'm probably really going to like it. It is a historical fiction surrounding uh, the Emperor Hadrian, uh, and so I really like Hadrian. Hadrian, for a long time, was my favorite Roman emperor. Uh, if you have a favorite Roman emperor, let me know down below. Hadrian still rates quite highly for me, but I think nowadays I prefer Constantine. Uh, but this is one that I'm hoping to get to very soon. I think that I'm probably really going to enjoy this. Speaking of thrift books, I really think their motto should be kind of the Forrest Gump you never know what you're gonna get. Uh, because sometimes you order something from thrift books and it's deemed acceptable and you think, yeah, acceptable is all that it can be deemed as. But sometimes you order something from thrift books and it's called acceptable and you wind up with this. I mean, this has barely been read. I really don't get upset about this on a penguin black spine because I do think they wear extremely easily. Uh, they really truly do. But this has no prior annotations in it. It is a newer penguin black spine. I am just really thrilled about this. I just don't really know why it was called acceptable and not at least good or very good, which is what I would call it because it is in incredible condition. But this is the complete essays of Michelle de Montagne, or Montaigne, uh, forgive me, because I really do need to look up the appropriate pronunciation there. Some people say it both ways. But this is something that I really wanted to pick up for my Napoleon project, because Napoleon really liked Montaigne's essays uh, and frequently reread them. And I can see why they're really, really big. It's a huge, huge book, and I don't have hopes that I'm gonna finish this this year, that I would finish this in a month. Uh, this is definitely going to be a book that I kind of read in part here and there. So I'm excited to get started with this, but I'm not gonna worry about finishing it in any certain length of time. 
Next up, we have a general history of the Pirates by Daniel Defoe. I picked this up uh, when I was on vacation last month because I went to Beaufort, North Carolina, uh, and Blackbeard used to hang out around there sometimes. And so it's kind of known for being uh, a real pirate haunt. Actually, immediately off the coast of Beaufort, about a mile out, is where the Queen Anne's Revenge went down, uh, which was Blackbeard's ship. And so Blackbeard really liked it in North Carolina, not because it was really beautiful or it had really great people or anything cheesy like that. Uh, North Carolina's coast is extremely rocky uh, and we have a lot of little islands off of our coast. So pirates like Blackbeard really liked North Carolina because they could take their smaller ships in and feel pretty secure that the British Navy was not really going to be able to pursue them. And because there are all these small islands, it's a great place to kind of hide your treasure. I'm really excited about this because I knew nothing about it. Uh, Daniel Defoe was actually writing very close to the time in which these men were living. Uh, so this is essentially a primary source of the golden age of piracy. And I am really excited about it. I like the way Daniel Defoe writes. I think he's going to become a favorite author for me. I'm not quite sure yet because I have really only finished one thing by him. But I loved it and I really liked his writing style so I have a good feeling about him. I also picked up Captain Blood by Raphael Sabatini when I was down at the beach because this is also a book about pirates. Uh, this is apparently a very swashbuckling tale and I'm really excited to read this one. Uh, it feels like a very appropriate summer read, so hopefully this is one that I will pick up very soon. I also picked up Rob Roy by Walter Scott. I really like Sir Walter Scott. I really, really love his poetry and I loved Ivanhoe. A few things compete with Ivanhoe for me. It's been years since I read it and sometimes I will finish a book that clearly was very adventurous, that was clearly influenced by Ivanhoe and I will think to myself, that was good, but was it Ivanhoe? And I do that even with books that really shouldn't even be compared to Ivanhoe. I'll think that was good was it Ivanhoe? And so I feel like Walter Scott and I really get on. Uh, and so I'm excited about Rob Roy. I know nothing about the figure of Rob Roy. Uh, so this is going to be a really experimental book for me. Uh, whereas with Ivanhoe, I did know quite a bit about Robin Hood. I know nothing about Rob Roy. Uh, and so I'm really open to his interpretation. I also picked up a copy of The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. This is one of my favorite books of all time and I've never owned a copy of it. Uh, I got it out from the library when I was in seventh grade. I remember this like it was yesterday. And few books have ever blown me away in the way that The Picture of Dorian Gray did. Uh, but again, I was probably a very impressionable what, 12 year old? And so the drama of it definitely would have worked well for me. Uh, but this is one of the newer Penguin classics with the kind of white text rather than the orange. I really don't like it. I don't think it's as well made as the older Penguin classics. That's just my opinion. And I would love to know who picked this portrait because this is not at all what I envision Dorian Gray as. Dorian Gray lives in my brain uh, as the guy who played him from The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, uh, Stuart. I know his name is Stuart, that's all I've got, but he embodies Dorian Gray. I think Dorian Gray has long hair and I think he's pretty. I don't necessarily think he's handsome, I think he's pretty. Uh, I think Ben Barnes, uh, when Ben Barnes was kind of in the age of Prince Caspian, that's what I envision Dorian Gray as. Uh, and that is not what this guy is. This guy is too, too clean shaven. He's too regular looking. I think Dorian Gray should be spectacular, but who am I to judge? I don't work for Penguin, but I really don't like that they chose this portrait. And on the whole, I don't necessarily like the new additions, the new updated Penguins. I just don't really feel as though they are as nicely made. Uh, as the older editions. Let me know down below how you're feeling about this. If you've picked up any of these newer penguins, do you like them? I also got Pleasure, which is by Gabriele D'Annunzio, uh, and I have never heard of this. This popped up recommended to me on Thrift Books, and because it was an Italian classic, I didn't even read what it was about. I just added it to my cart, but the back of the book compares it quite frequently 
to Dorian Gray, which I think is really interesting. Uh, and this is a really recent translation in the past 20 years uh, because the only other English translation of this work apparently butchered it uh, because this is a very sexual, sensual book. Uh, and the first English translation during the Victorian period uh, was trying to sanitize it for an English audience that wouldn't accept uh, those themes. So I found that really, really fascinating. I don't really know what this is about. I think a guy is going around Rome having a whole bunch of affairs, uh, and it was written in the late 1800s. I am really looking forward to this uh, because I do tend to really like Italian classics, and so I'm really excited to see how I feel about this one and if it does really compare to Dorian Gray. Another book that I picked up is Pamela by Samuel Richardson, and this is a classic from the 1700s. And I've heard quite a bit about Samuel Richardson. I've never read him. I think it's Clarissa that I would actually probably like more than Pamela because I believe Clarissa is an epistolary novel and it's written in letters. I do know this was a pretty revolutionary novel for its time because it deals with Pamela, who is a servant girl and she is constantly refusing advances from the man that she works for, I believe. And that's what really causes tension and causes the plot to really kick off. Uh, but it was really revolutionary in the day to say that somebody who worked in the household would have the ability to say no to their employer. Uh, and so I think there was a lot of conversation happening about Pamela around the time of its publication. And I'm really interested in this. I'm not quite sure when I'll get to it, but when I saw it at the used bookstore, I knew I had to pick it up. I also picked up a collection of Ben Jonson's plays, uh, and I think it includes The Alchemist, which apparently is one of his most famous, but it does include other plays. I am not Ben Jonson's biggest fan. Uh, I used to really dislike him because I read quite a few of his plays when I was in university. My minor was in late medieval Renaissance literature, uh, and so I read quite a bit of Ben Jonson and Shakespeare, and it's always talked about as if there had to have been this big rivalry between Ben Jonson and Shakespeare, and in my head, definitely there was, and definitely Shakespeare is better, uh, but there's a lot about Ben Jonson that hasn't worked for me previously, but I wonder if I read him now, if I read him on my own and not in a classroom setting, not for writing a paper or anything like that, if my enjoyment of him would go up. So I'm looking forward to giving Ben Johnson another chance. Then my most exciting find from the used bookstore in the past few months is Notre Dame de Paris by Victor Hugo. And I already own an edition of this. It is the Barnes and Noble Classic Edition that I think I also picked up at a library book sale for 50 cents. And this I got with credit at the used bookstore, so I paid nothing. Uh, but I figured this would probably be a better translation. And I am now really not partial to the Barnes & Noble classics. I really don't like the way they feel in my hand. They're very hard to read. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why that is for me. Uh, so when I saw the Oxford World's Classics Edition, I decided to pick it up and I'm really pumped about this. I'm probably gonna read this very soon. I keep putting it off. I've wanted to read it since I picked it up, but I kept saying I have all of these other obligations. I have these other buddy reads. I have readathons and Notre Dame de Paris does not fit in with any of them. But I'm honestly about to say who cares because I really, really want to read this. I have such a strong, good feeling uh, about The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I feel so sure I will love it because people have warned me, they've warned me, as if this won't be a draw. Uh, people have warned me that this book is not about the plot but that it is about the architecture of Notre Dame and medieval architecture in Paris in general. That sounds amazing to me. I don't even need a plot. Just wax poetic to me about medieval architecture. I just think I'm really gonna love it. I've always felt like Victor Hugo and I are going to like each other. We're going to get on. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to starting this probably very soon. Another French classic that I picked up is The Vicomte de Braglion 
by Alexander Dumas. I'm not quite sure that I'm saying that correctly, and I'm probably not. But this is one in the Three Musketeers series, and I just have the best feeling about that as well. I've never read The Three Musketeers. I love Alexander Dumas. He's one of my favorite authors, but I have yet to read probably his most famous work, which is The Three Musketeers. But I'm really excited about the series in general, and so I wanted to kind of collect them. But apparently, Sometimes this work is put in with 20 years after or with the man in the iron mask. And so I'm not quite sure where it falls in the series. But when I finally read The Three Musketeers and probably love it, I will already have this on my shelf ready for me. I picked up my first Gustave Flaubert, and this is Sentimental Education. I am not quite sure what this is about. I do think it's kind of a more interpersonal family romantic drama uh, that is set in Paris, but I had never heard of this. I have heard quite a bit about Madame Bovary, uh, but I have never heard anything about this, so I'm really excited about it. Uh, I think I'm probably going to like it. Uh, people have said things to me about Madame Bovary that make me think it won't work well for me. Uh, so hopefully if I start with something else, I will really enjoy Gustave Flaubert. Last but not least of the French literature is 93 by Victor Hugo. And this was Victor Hugo's last novel. Uh, and it is set during the reign of terror uh, in 1793, during the late French Revolution. And I think I might actually read this before I read Notre Dame de Paris uh, because it is a little bit shorter. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to this one. I also found at the used bookstore The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And this is going to be a second and last chance for Henry James. I really did not like uh, The Portrait of a Lady, but I have liked adaptations of Turn of the Screw. So I'm hopeful about this one. I'm also going to save this one for Victober because it does feel really spooky. It feels really appropriate to October, to the Halloween time of year. And so I am hoping that I like this. A lot of people seem to think that Henry James would work well for me. I'm often recommended Henry James books, and I just really did not like the portrait of a lady, and it kind of soured me on him as a whole. So hopefully my opinion of him can turn around when I pick up The Turn of the Screw. And last but not least, I picked up The Fortunes of Perkin Warbeck by Mary Shelley, my queen. Uh, this is her historical fiction set during the Wars of the Roses following Perkin Warbeck, who was a pretender to the English throne. He claimed to be one of the princes in the tower, so he did claim to be somebody with a legitimate claim to the English throne. Uh, and he was backed by a lot of people. And apparently Mary Shelley seems to think he was actually who he said he was. Uh, and so that's the basis of this book is that Perkin Warbeck actually is one of the princes in the tower. And I am really, really pumped about this. It is so big though, that I'm not quite sure when I'm gonna be able to dive into it, but I really want to give it the time that it deserves. I really wanna sit with it for a long time. And I just feel really good about this because I've loved what I've read from Mary Shelley previously. And I think she does historical fiction very, very well. In fact, I actually think I prefer her historical fiction to her other works. So those are all of the classics that I have been picking up over the past few months. I would love to know if you have read any of these, if you recommend them, and I would also love to know what classics you have been hauling recently. But that's going to be all for me today. I hope you're all having a great week. Happy reading. Goodbye.